Sictum Sempra is a word that first shows up in the sixth book of the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Its first appearance is quite nonchalant. It is one out of many annotations in a potions book that was clearly pre-owned by an alchemy nerd. So how did I immediately know it was a spell? A made-up fantasy word on a potions book, written by a potions geek. By this simple logic, I should have imagined it to be potion related. But I didn't. I immediately knew it was a one spell. Huzzah! And that's because since the beginning of the series, one spells always made me think of Gregorian chant. <laughs> That's by design. Today we're going to explore this language creation process and hopefully we're going to learn how to make our own recognizable words. World building is not a skill that you can improve just by reading about it. It is a craft that requires practice and creation and this is the whole point of this series of videos here the world building tower together we study incredible pieces of world building and from then we extract a lesson that we can all try our hand to create our own solutions and improve while we do so important disclaimer before we start i do not endorse the author of the world building i'll be talking about today I will also not mention the name of that person. Nothing forces me to. But I will add a card here and also link in the doobly doo below uh, with my opinion on this whole art versus the artist and especially how to engage with the art uh, that you consider a bit tainted by the artist. Uh, I'm no expert on the matter, but since I'm talking publicly about art and writing and world building, I thought that my opinion should be clear uh, so this video will be that. Okay, let's talk about made-up words. And first of all, I want to talk about what Harry Potter didn't do. There's a famous linguistics experiment that gives test subjects two different shapes and two different names and asks them which shape is named what. Most participants say that this spiky shape here is named Kiki and this roundish blob is named Bulba. Interestingly enough, when I first heard about this experiment back in Brazil, those were not the names I'd been given. Instead, I was told the names were Takeshi and Molimo. Honestly, it would work with other names just as well. There's something really human here. There's something about the very origins of language. Some sounds seem to evoke micro-emotions that can be used for naming. Look at those two images here. Which one is named Gorflax and which one is named Didilu? See? There's a lot of fantasy names that are created just using this method, just by wielding those micro-emotions. If I saw a, a dragon whose name is very guttural, that's, that's exactly that. I'm here to argue that this method is okay, there's nothing wrong with it, but there is something more powerful out there. Something that is less about our reptilian brain and more about our neocortex. Hence, Harry Potter. Wait, we're gonna talk about Harry Potter, so I wanna put my official Gryffindor outfit. And of course I'm a Gryffindor, of course. Huh? Huh? Hmm? Mm-hmm? Mm-hmm? Mm -hmm. Found this in a magical flea market. <laughs> Expelliarmus, Petrificus Totalus, Impedimenta, Finite Incantatum. I knew Sectum Sempra was supposed to be a spell because they all have this Latin vibe. Since the first book, they all sounded so churchy to me. This is never disclaimed in the books. The word Latin is never mentioned. This is rather felt by the reader. We're not lectured on it. We just get it because of consistency. And because we've all heard Latin words before, even if we never study the language, just through books and movies and whatnot, our brains can easily tap into that consistency through that same process of piggybacking I explained a couple of episodes ago. Link to that here on top and also in the description below. 
It is also noticeable when this consistency is broken. Sometimes for good effect, like the fabled Avada Kedavra, that instead of, of drawing from Latin, draws from Aramaic. And we love it even more for that, the name is very iconic. Sometimes for ill effect, like uh, Stupefy, which sounds way too Anglo-Saxon compared to other spells, and to me at least, sounds kind of wrong. But most spells just follow that sweet, sweet consistency, just like Sigtun Simpra. This Gryffindor thing is way too warm, sorry. <laughs> Ooh, I'm sweating. Harry Potter is by far not the only narrative that uses this real-world inspiration and consistency process. Look around pop media you enjoy and you'll find plenty of examples. The obviously Italian names in the Venice-inspired lies of Locke Lamora, with names like Via Camorazza, Sandovani and Vencarlo Barsavi. The Looney Tunesque names of cuphead bosses like Baroness von Bonbon, Guppy Le Grande, and Ribby and Crooks. The Greek mythology aesthetics of Magic the Gathering's Theros block, not following the original Greek gods or the Greek language, but getting close enough so that the reference is blunt. The Western thinker's naming of Near Automata. Sometimes be very direct, giving a character a philosopher's name. Other times being less obvious, like 2B's name being a reference to Shakespeare's Yorick monologue, 2B, or not 2B. And sometimes quite obscure, like 9S's name being both a play of words in Latin and German, referencing the other side of that same monologue, not 2B. That one I had to Google. <laughs> the point about all of those names is that they all have a, a clear, strong thread between them. If the writers of those games and books and movies were to make even more games and books and movies, they could get that same thread, that same consistency and repeat it over and over and over again. We could name a thousand Harry Potter spells and they would all feel like Harry Potter spells because of those inherent, unspoken rules. And still those names wouldn't feel repetitive because the focus here is not the combination between vowels and consonants, but rather is, a, is this cultural piggybacking. So we can get completely different words like reducto and levicorpus, and we can put it in the same bag and it makes sense. Okay, let's give it a try then. Let's draw inspiration from one spells. Let's try to create our own unique words. Alright, let's make up some words of our own. My word, said Granny Weatherwax. Thank you to the three people who understood this reference. <laughs> First of all, we need something to name. In Harry Potter's case, that was spells, which is convenient because those elements are novel to the reader, so they need to be explained and addressed and, and named. So let's think of an element in our stories that is unknown to the reader. In general, not always, but, but in general, it's not worth it to change the name of something that already has a word associated with it. It's better to use this resource for novel things. Our spirit dance moves, our thousands of genders, our alien species. Just like with the spells, the readers should already have a, a conceptual idea of what you're talking about. Like in Harry Potter, the readers approach the books already having an idea what magic and what spells are. But then you get to the book and you can name individual spells. Okay, so with that selected, it's time for us to change the focus to that strong consistency thread that will unify all of our language choices. We want something from the real world. We want something that the, the readers have heard of before, even if they're not experts, even if they only know it vaguely. We're allowed to use the exact real-world words, just like Neurotomata did, but we're also allowed to change them a little bit if that sounds right, just like Harry Potter did. And finally, we want to flex our creative muscles by crafting a couple of those words and positioning them in a text, a little paragraph, a little story that will show you and your reader how would those words feel if they were part of a, a book or a game dialogue. No need for immense multi-page stories, just a couple of paragraphs with 
here and there one of those new words just so you have a real sense of how they feel. Okay, that's the exercise and with that we go to the last spot of the video which is my take on this, not the right take or anything, just one example of what could be done with those rules and I urge you to also do the exercise on your own and if you want to be kind to me you can post your exercise in the comments below it makes my day okay let's do it the focus here is not the world building in itself it's more the language aspect of it but just so we're all on the same page let me give you a little rundown in this world I'm creating light and color have a tangible emotional effect on people Changing a room's light from, for example, violet to green will change also the tone and the topics of conversation in that room. It's a powerful chemical effect on people that they have no control over. Which means that in such world, our definitions of color are insufficient. Color affects people too profoundly. We can't just grab all this spectrum here and call everything pink. Even when you add more granularity, that helps. Fair enough, but this world will need thousands of new words for particular shades. People get specific about their colors. Excellent. So now what will I do about this language thread connecting all of those new words? I'm gonna draw my reference from a, not from a language, but from a symbolic universe that is already somewhat connected to this emotional manipulation via colors. My new words will all be Hollywood inspired. In this world, there's no Hollywood, there's no movie industry as we understand it. So for them, Spielberg is not a director, it's not a person. It is the name of a particular shade of cyan. Can I create a scene around that? Let's give it a shot. The door to the meeting room opened and I had mere seconds to prepare my counter move. They had chosen a bright carry light for this occasion, but there was a hidden warm tone underneath. The walls were probably not white as per usual, but Tarantino. The wave of enthusiasm that surged through me was so strong I had barely the time to think, the bastards really believe I'm an amateur. In moments, I was ready to close the deal and head home with a smile. But I was also holding my own filter box with the setting I had quickly typed when I first saw their shade move. I had a protocol. I placed my own filter box next to theirs. Mine was set for a toxic von Trier that could never be lit on its own. Combined with the carry light and Tarantino paint, it created a more tone that filled the room with sobriety. Common courtesy would make them wait for at least 15 minutes before changing their own shade. And even so, they could do little against someone bold enough to pull a Von Trier. How to counteract that? The best they could do would be a weak Wes Anderson, and I'd still be on top of that game. The moor was a clear message to the two bastards, but I also knew it would make them as scented and controlled as I was. So, what did you folks think? I'm here wondering if we imagine the same directors and actors as the same colors. Because if we've thought differently, probably we have completely different aesthetics for this same scene. But anyway, that was really fun. <laughs> I like to experiment with those uh, little fantasy scenarios that are really far away from swords and dragons and elves. Not that I don't like that, I love that. But uh, I also like to go to a completely different angle on fantasy. It helps me expand my own internal idea of what fantasy is and, and could be. And with that, I leave you for today. Thank you very much for your attention. A special thank you to my patrons. You are so, so generous to this tiny channel. Oh, thank you so much for supporting me. And uh, with that, I leave you folks and I hope you have colored colored and colorful dreams. <laughs> Bye!